I'm trying to figure out if I have my pack turned on or off. I have it turned on now. I apologize, Autumn. Everybody blames the sound people, and it's not them. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. Welcome back from Easter. How many of you were here last week? Raise your hand up nice and high. Like all of you were, and your family members were here last week. So how many of you are just excited to have your seat back? So good. Hey, open up your programs for just a second. By the way, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. If you're a guest this morning, if you're tuning in for the first time, if you're out in the atrium, or uh, I don't know if you'll be out on the patio today. It's a little chilly, windy out there, but uh, that's all right. Uh, great to have everybody with us today. Open up your program. Inside your program on the top right corner, you'll see a little picture of a bag of coffee. It says, Sip of Hope. So for many of you, you might know this, some of you might not know, every kind of five, six weeks, we change our coffee partner here, and it's always an organization that's doing really amazing good work. And so May is the National Mental Health Awareness Month, and so Sip of Hope Coffee is like the only coffee roaster in the world where all of their proceeds go to support mental health, to support suicide prevention. So every cup of coffee you drink is helping do that, and so thank you very much. And I want to encourage you that we we're able to partner with these folks. Somebody asked me as they came in, like, where do we, where do we pay for the coffee? Where do we put the donation? In? I was like, that offering basket when it goes by. You just put your coffee tip money in there. And that's what buys the coffee. So the coffee's there. And you might have noticed coffee mugs today. Did anybody notice those? So we're trying to reduce what we're using in paper consumption here. So the coffee mugs are out there. Use the coffee mug and then do me a favor. Don't take it home. Just pretend like it's Panera. Look for, this, look for the tub, put your used coffee mug in there. And we got a great group of volunteers that provide coffee every morning, and they, sanit well, they kind of sanitize the cups in between. You know. No, they do. I'm just kidding. And so uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be reducing the amount of paper goods, and that's always good. So thanks, everybody, for doing that. I'm going to set this back here. My prop is now over with. All right? So, hey, we're in a series called Keeping Hope Alive. We launched this series last week. If you're kind of new to Crossroads, all of our kind of Sunday morning topics, they usually fit into a series, like six, seven, eight weeks. Sometimes if I get really long-winded, it'd be like nine weeks. Sometimes if I don't have much to say, it's like one week, you know. Uh, but uh, so we're in this series called Keeping Hope Alive, which is kind of a third part in a spirituality of peacemaking series that we've been doing over this last year, which are really going to turn into kind of a pathway for folks to kind of understand what, like spirituality, what we think of when we talk about God and the Christian life. I know that word can kind of have all kinds of meaning these days to just help folks along in their journey. So you're, we're going to be developing these out into groups that people can participate in. And this is our final one called Keeping Hope Alive. And this series is really about how do we as a group of people, as a collective called the church or a church or a network of people committed to peacemaking, how do we live into what we say is true, that Jesus lives and keeping Jesus alive through our actions, through our commitments as a community within a broader community. So we have all of the buildings up, and the theme is really the church, the local church, Crossroads, we exist as part of a community, a beautiful community, both here in northern Colorado, but then also any place you are that you're listening, that you're tuning in, that you're watching, you're keeping hope alive in that setting. And our anchor verse, kind of the, the, the verse from Scripture that holds everything together for this series comes from a letter in the New Testament called Hebrews, and it says this, let us hold unwaveringly to our confession that gives us hope. And I think that confession is that hope lives, that Jesus lives, this confession, this confession that God is present always with us. And the one who made that promise is trustworthy, right? That, that Jesus is trustworthy. So we must consider how to rouse one another to love and good works. Right? we got to figure out how do, we, how do we encourage each other as a group to these good works, to this love in our community. And we shouldn't stay away from our assembly, as is the custom of some. Right? There's something powerful about when we gather together. Yesterday, I stayed up past my bedtime. Y'all ever do that? Now, here's what happens on a Sunday morning when I stay up past my bedtime on a Saturday night. My filter gets even less. <laughs> like, like, you'll know. Like, I don't have much of a Christian filter. Like, I don't have much tolerance for religious filters, right? So you just kind of get me. That's what happens. But when I don't get a lot of sleep at night, I mean, you get the full 
me, all right? So you got to bear with me. But here's the thing. Last night we went down to Denver, right? And we went and saw Johnny Swim, band we like, Wendy and I and our daughter. We went and saw Johnny Swim. Some of you know Johnny Swim. You can clap for Johnny Swim. It's a great band. And uh, we went down to the Ogden Theater. I'd never been down there. Kind of like a House of Blues experience. You have to stand the whole time. Oh, gosh. I'm like 45 years old. I'm not like standing the whole time. Didn't, the concert didn't start until 9 o'clock. Yeah, 9 o'clock at night, which means they didn't come on until like 9.45. I got home at like 1 in the morning. I was like, what are people doing awake at this time of night? So I get home. But here's the thing. Here's something really powerful that happened. We're in this kind of little, little theater, and everybody's kind of crammed in, and we're talking. And, and it's such a cool band, but he talked about like there was this something really powerful that happens. Like the band was going to bring one-third of the energy. That's what he said. And then they said... The audience was going to bring the other third of the night. But then the other third happens when you're together. And he talked about how a really great show, uh, there's, there's community. But a really, really great show, there's communion. And uh, it was really powerful. And, and I thought, that's, that's it right there. Like, like, that's what happens when we gather. Like, there is this communion, right? And there's, there's just nothing like it when you're in the space together as much as we can be. There's something really powerful that takes place where two or three are gathered. We talked a little bit about that last week. And that's the anchor verse. Like, how, when we're gathered together, right, what is the hope that stays alive in our community? And how do we do that? What are the commitments, right? How many quitters do we have in the house? Any quitters? Couple of you, fair enough. I like it. You got to own that. Just who I am. I'm a quitter. I didn't quit last night. I stayed all the way till the end. People were clapping for like a what is it called? Like the um, encore. Yeah. No, by the way, y'all have never done that for me here. I just just throwing that out there. I was like, oh, I bet that feels good. People want more of what you have to do, but I don't know. Usually people are you know leaving early or whatever. It's to- but I stayed through. I stuck it out. I didn't quit. Right. I didn't quit. Uh, most of us don't want to be known as a quitter. I don't think I'm a quitter. Uh, I, I will slow everybody down on a hike, but I won't quit, right? I've gone out on hikes, be like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. Do we need to turn back? Never. We'll be here for four days, but I'm not quitting, right? But I did quit a job one time in my life. I quit it, like quit. Not like resigned and you give them your notice, like quit. Like it's not worth it. I was in college, and I needed a summer job because I was getting married. and had no money. I was living in the apartment of a church. That is creepy. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, that is creepy. Don't ever live in a church if you don't have to, right? So I'm living in this apartment inside of a church, got no money, and I see this listing. I think they were even people in the church. And they said, well, we need people to come and do, like, it was lawn care. I have office hands, okay? Let's just be honest. I don't, I don't understand. I, first time I mowed a lawn on a rider lawnmower, I didn't know anything about you had to put the deck down. So I like mowed the whole field, and all you had were tire marks, right? <laughs> That's all you had. But this was like a good paying, just like in the late 90s, they were paying $20 an hour, right? And so I was like, I'm going to go. I, that should have given me a clue that this was going to be awful, right? So I go, go do this wonderful, come home. It's horrible. But I get home, I'm like, all right, it's fine. Then all of a sudden, I start like itching like really bad on my legs. Like, what is going on? And I go and I take a shower and I have like a million little like bug bites on my leg from where my sock was. So there were these things called chiggers. Y'all ever seen these little demons, right? I, I called them. I was like, I'm not coming back to your chigger infested field. I don't know. I quit. I just quit because it was miserable, right? We quit sometimes for appropriate reasons. Like that was an appropriate reason, right? Sometimes we quit on TV shows. We quit on a movie the other night. This movie that was, she was nominated, Chris, uh, the, the Twilight Woman, Kristen Stewart. Is that her? Yeah, Kristen Stewart. She was in a movie called Spencer, some like period piece about Princess Diana, some Christmas. It was awful. Like we quit. Like halfway through, I looked over at Wendy. She looked at me like, why are we, fin- are we finishing this? What's going on here? We just quit it, right? So we quit TV shows. We quit movies, right? You get into a series. We quit things, right? And the truth is, we quit on other stuff, too, in life, right? Relationships, sometimes we quit on. Sometimes we just kind of give up hope on our finances, and we're like, whatever, I want to do it. We just swipe the card. So quitting is kind of a part of life. But here's what I find fascinating. I actually think that church, like Christendom, the local church oftentimes quits believing in the power of love. Like the fruit, the actions, the attitudes of a local church often demonstrate that there's just this attitude where we've actually quit 
believing that love can actually transform this world. We quit believing the fundamental foundational message of Jesus that it's love that transforms. And it seems like pie in the sky sometimes. It seems like it'll never work. It seems foolish. But that we quit on it. And you know how I think we quit on it? It's because sometimes we go, oh, well, you know what? It's just not working. Like I've been loving this person in my neighborhood and they're not changing. They aren't believing like me, right? They don't, they don't think and they don't hold the same values. I do. So we just kind of dismiss them. Person might show up, come to church. And we see them as little projects. We got to get them to behave like me right? And all of a sudden, when they don't behave like you or behave like me, we're like, well, I know love doesn't work here, right? And we forget that people in our world have a whole background and history of experiences that will determine how they respond, how I respond to concepts like the divine, to the idea of a word like God, right? To this idea of church. Like people respond differently based on all of the things that they've gone through in life. And when we stop, when we like think, oh, well, somebody's not believing like I want them to. Somebody's not behaving like I want them to. When we stop that, like, just continual love, right? We're not looking for anything, just continual love, 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 love. But when we stop that because they don't respond to the love the way we think they should, you know what happens? Like, when we just stop loving, we quit loving, like, that's when hope dies. That's when hope dies. Hope dies in us for, for someone to find joy or to find hope or to whatever it might be. But hope has this tendency to die when we quit persevering in this thing called love. Now, Scripture, I think, offers us a little bit of wisdom as it comes to this idea of persevering in love, like not quitting in love. And so I want to look at a parable today. And if you've been around church for a while, you're going to say, what in the world does this parable have to do with what Ryan is talking about today? Welcome to my world. Right? So we're going to talk about a very familiar parable for those of you that if you've been so blessed to have been a part of a church for a long time, you've probably heard this parable uh, about the seed and the sower. And Jesus shares this parable. Now, a little quick introduction on parables. Parables are little short stories, uh, and, uh, and, and they oftentimes don't have an interpretation. They're just like a short story that Jesus would tell. He'd go around, he'd tell these short stories, and he's like, think about it. And that's what it would be. Now, this one in particular parable is one that we have in all three of the Gospels, right? All the Gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, not in John. No parables in John. John doesn't believe they existed. Now, so here's the thing. So all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, and, and you got to remember, Matthew and Luke are using Mark as material. They're crafting a story for their community. They're taking the life of Jesus. They're interplaying it with what's going on in their world. And that's what would happen oftentimes with these parables. So Jesus would give a parable, get the crowd thinking. Now, most of the time in, in the New Testament, when we have these parables, there's no interpretation. Jesus just kind of gives it, and he's just like throws it out there for you, which is pretty awesome. Every now and then you get an interpretation, like in this example, but most Jesus scholars that like look at the life of the historical Jesus and what we can best reconstruct, they would actually say that Jesus probably didn't give like any one in particular interpretation of a parable. The interpretations that we have are the interpretations of the authors for the community in which they're living. That's the beauty. We have one gospel message, one gospel of peace, of hope for the world, and we have four different versions of that gospel like lived out between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Isn't that beautiful? That's what like providence gave us. Not one that everybody's got to believe this is how it happened, right? And we freak out, by the way, when we don't do that. But we just have this good multitude of it. And so what I want to do is ask this question today. What would we take this parable and how would we look at it in our world of crossroads? Right? How can we free ourselves from this idea that the parable has to have one meeting for all of time, but what would it look like if we thought about our current context? There's a scholar, A.J. Levine, and she wrote a book called uh, Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. That's a good title, right? <laughs> That's a good title. And in it, she says this, reducing parables to a single meaning destroys their aesthetic, it destroys their beauty as well as their ethical potential. So I want to do what I think all the Gospels writers are doing. They're taking Jesus and they're applying Jesus to their world. They're taking this one message of Jesus, right? Freedom for the captive, right? Healing for the sick, sight to the blind, right? Good news to the poor. And they're applying it into their world. So I'd like to do the same today. I'd like to look at this parable and ask the question, what does this story about the seed and the sower 
invite us to understand about keeping hope alive in our broader community? Like, what could it teach us, right? So I want to read it from Luke chapter 8, right? So Luke chapter 8, here's the, here's the parable. It says, when a large crowd gathered with people from one town after another, journeying to him, what, what Luke is saying is Jesus was really popular. People were attracted to Jesus, right? He spoke in a parable. He said, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and it was trampled. And the birds of the sky ate it up. It was the seed trampled. Birds come and eat it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground. And when it grew, it withered for lack of moisture. So it didn't have what it took to gain strength, to gain root. And then he says, some seed fell on the thorns. And the thorns grew with it and choked it out. And some seed fell on good soil. And when it grew, it produced fruit a hundredfold. And after saying this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, hear ought to hear. So I want to bring some questions to this parable. Are you with me so far? Because we can receive another offering if you want to. I mean, if that sounds like more fun. Okay, so here's the deal. A few questions, right? Now, what is the seed, right? Now, Here's the thing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe this seed that's being sown differently. It's slight, but it's different, right? So for Mark's community, when he gives this parable, he just calls it the word. He says the seed is the word. That's all he says, the word. Okay. Implication being it's the words of Jesus, right? That's the idea. That's what he's implying. In Matthew's community, when Matthew writes it, he says the word of the kingdom. So it's a little different, right? So Matthew is saying it's this word of a countercultural way of life, the reign of God in this world, as described by Jesus, right? And then Luke, he calls it the word of God. What none of them meant, by the way, pardon me one second, what none of them meant was the Bible, okay? <laughs> Didn't exist back then, right? So let's just be sure. Nobody thought, oh, the Bible, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a reality, an invitation to participate in something that Jesus was showing and revealing. So here's what I would say for us, for the Crossroads community, we could think of the seed as the invitation to become a peacemaker. So if we're talking about this way of life, of following Jesus, where Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What we as a church offer to ourselves, to family, to friends, is this opportunity to live the life of a peacemaker grounded in Jesus, which is filled with hope in the presence of God and joy and struggle and pain and all of it, okay? So, so that's what I think we could take this as. If we're applying it, I would say like, if I were writing a gospel, which I'm not, but if I were writing, I would say, oh, the seed is the act of peacemaking, the seed is being a peacemaker. The seed is the peace of God. Now, the second question, well, who's the sower, right? So Mark's community, when Mark gives his rendition of this, like it's the one who gives the word, right? So it's the one who gives the word. Matthew's community, Matthew doesn't even mention the sower. It's like not important, <laughs> which is fascinating, right? Like it's not like it's God out there, like the universe, right? No. So for Mark, it's the one who sows the seed. For Matthew, doesn't even mention it. Not even important. Same thing with Luke. Doesn't even mention it, right? There's just, doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is this message of hope, this peacemaking way of life, whatever, the, the Jesus way, the word, the kingdom, right? So for Crossroads, I think what we could say, right, is the sower is the church, right? It's the gathered and scattered network of peacemakers, the ones that are throwing this peacemaking seed out there, that where peace is thrown, hope flourishes and grows and joy, right? So let's talk about these two words real quick, gathered and scattered, right? So the gathered church represents our corporate identity, this cross, and that's really what this whole series is about. The living in Christ series that we just did was about you as an individual, right? Believing like Jesus was kind of both, like what we as a church think, but what we want to creep into our lives is, are the beliefs of Jesus. This series is really about what we as a community are doing and what people are invited to participate in corporately. So it's our corporate identity. And it's all these activities that we do here to bring hope and to rewrite the five unacceptables as we've identified them in the world. What are those five unacceptables? Spiritual emptiness, poverty, illiteracy, fear of the other. When you hear fear of the other, think homophobia, sexism, and racism. 
So fear of the other. We're leaning hard into those with peacemaking efforts. And then finally, human trafficking. Those five unacceptables, right? So that's what we're doing as a gathered church. And the scattered church is just when you go out into your everyday normal life and you just live the hope of Jesus. You're a peacemaker at work, at your school, in your neighborhood, right? So we got the seed for Crossroads, which is peacemaking, right? This message of peace with one another, of wholeness for the world that this way of Jesus produces. And then we have the sowers, right? And that's the gathered church. That's you as an individual. Now let's talk about the places that the seed falls. And I want to really dig in here because I want to show that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all describe these soils, these grounds a little differently. So hang in there with me. I might be the only one having fun doing this, but we'll, we'll do it together. It'll be like a little, a little wisdom party, okay? So let's talk about the path, right? Mark chapter 4, verse 14, Mark describes the path. He says, this is what the path is. As soon as they hear the seed that falls on the, the, that falls on the path, Satan comes at once and takes away the word sown in them. Right, so that's what he says the path is all about. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, this is what Matthew says. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the words of the kingdom. Remember, Matthew, it's the word of the kingdom. They hear the word of the kingdom without understanding it. Isn't that interesting? Tot very different. Like Matthew gives an under, Matthew says, this is why it doesn't, this is why they hear, but they don't get it. And then the evil one comes and steals away what was sown in his heart. That feels a little different than like, right? Like Mark, you're just like, whoa, like Satan comes. But in, 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 in Matthew here, we've got this like, oh, there's, there's some not understanding that takes place. There's some stealing that takes place. Luke describes it like this. Those on the path are the ones who have heard, but the devil comes. We get the devil in this one. The devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. I love it. That they might not believe and be saved. So a whole different kind of language. Like saved from what? What does that even mean? Now here's the thing. When I think about all of this, when I, think, when I look at this parable and I think about the world that we live in, post-enlightenment, where we know that the gods don't produce floods anymore. <laughs> We know that. Like, science tells us that. So in a post-enlightenment world, when we think about evil, we don't have to, we can, you can like personify it as it does. Those are metaphors, I think. What does that mean? Like, how do we think about it for us as crossroads? And here's, the, here's what I think the path is in our current reality. I think the path is the place where the peacemaking seed, where the seed of the gospel is sown, but that, that place is marked by trauma. See, that's what I think the path is for us. I think the path is like this place where trauma has come into a person's life and it's almost made it completely difficult to understand or believe that there's goodness in the universe, that that which holds all things together could possibly be good and be forced because there's been so much wounding that's taken place. And that's kind of like, so we have to take the pre-enlightenment language of devil we have to take the pre-enlightenment language of demons, and we have to think it through this lens of, okay, what's the deeper truth that this culture would have been trying to make sense of in their world with their understandings? We don't throw it out, but we say, okay, let's, we can fast forward now. Like, we kind of understand a bit more about science. We kind of know that, that we don't live in this three-part system of a firmament that holds water above us where we are, and then like the earth below. Like we know that there's not three levels. of. We just know it's different now. But the deep truth is like, how do I make sense that something so powerful and good as love could be rejected by someone? Because there's trauma in our world. I've sat with people whose hearts are just broken as they've tried and sought to love people who've gone through so much trauma, like love itself has been distorted. So that's that path. That's that space. Let's talk about the rocky ground for a minute. For those of you that are keeping score, there's four total types of grounds that we're going to be looking at. So we've got one down, I know. All right, here's number two. I've got to look at the clock. All right, Mark chapter four. Here's how Mark describes the rocky ground. These are the ones sown on rocky ground who, when they hear the word, receive it at once with joy, but they have no root. They only last for a time. Okay, so Mark says, like, there's these folks that they just, they hear about this idea of God, of the message, of the word for Mark, and it's wonderful, but then whoosh, it just falls away. They don't have any root. And he says, when tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away, right? Here's how Matthew describes it, somewhat similarly. 
He says, the seed sown on the rocky ground is the one who hears the word, receives it at once with joy, but he has no root and lasts only for a time. And when some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. You can see that there's a relationship there. Like Matthew, like literally in the Greek is like word for word. This is why we know Matthew had Mark, right? Luke says something very, very similar. Again, those on the rocky ground are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, but they have no root. They believe only for a time and fall away in time of trial. So kind of the parable that understanding is, listen, there's this kind of space in which you receive and hear, and this sounds like a really wonderful idea, this peacemaking life, this way of Jesus, but then something happens, something comes into our life. You know, the, the, the words here are tribulation and persecution. So how do we think about that in our time? So for Crossroads, think of it this way, right? The rocky ground, like that's the field where divine love is experienced, right? Like there's a real genuine experience of the divine and it's beautiful and it's wonderful, but it lacks support in times of opposition or doubt. So some of you are sitting in this space and we would say in church words, by the grace of God are still in church because your experience has been so devastating. Like you have had a deeply rooted experience with the divine, but somewhere along the way, maybe you got a question and that question was rejected. Maybe you faced an opposition in your life because of what you were trying to live into the, your understanding of God, of Jesus, of truth, produced a lot of pain. And so, so here's the thing. We have to think of that root system that didn't exist, right? So, so what the gospel writers say, there was no root, right? I don't think necessarily the root system is like they didn't read their Bible enough, okay? Like that's, that's how it gets presented. Like, oh, these people, they didn't go to all the discipleship classes that were offered at church. They didn't sing in the choir enough. They didn't volunteer enough. So they just fell away. It's their fault. Like that's the way this is always taught. But you think of a root system as a support system. <laughs> think of a root system as something that continues to feed and nourish the plant, right? I'm not a farmer. I got chiggers. I left that area a long time ago. I'm like, that is, I'm leaving that up to much stronger people than me. But I know this, like that root system is what supports the growth of the plant. And I think there, the, the reality is we have a whole lot of people who've had a great deal of experience with the divine, but they got a question, <laughs> right? They were just like, I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why does it say this? And then it says this here. And like, I don't get that. And I have to believe that. And, and then all of a sudden, well, no, you're not allowed to ask those questions. So there wasn't a support system for the question to be heard and, and wrestled with. A little sidebar, my dream, like I would love to like be a part of a church that like, like centered itself on questions and not answers, right? Our world is just filled with answers, doctrines. This is what you have to believe. Like I just think it'd be powerful for a community to say, oh, we're just, we're going to wrestle with this question. Like why is the Bible so important still today? That feels like a lot of fun. Let's just keep talking about that. But you don't have to believe everything everybody else believes about the Bible, but let's just talk about that. Let's talk about what does it mean to say that the cross is a, is a saving action. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's as a community like, agree that there's some centrality to that in the Christian faith, but we don't all have to believe the same way about it, right? And see, a space like that supports growth. A space like that supports, it's a root system, right? When opposition and questions come about. Okay, the thorns, we've got to keep going, right? The children's people are going to kill me, all right? The thorns. Mark chapter 4. Here's how Mark describes the thorns. There are people who hear the word, but worldly anxiety. You know what? Let's just skip this one over. It has nothing to do with America. This has nothing, nothing at all to do with the West. The wor worldly anxiety, the lure of riches, the craving for other things intrude and choke the word and it bears no fruit. Can I just go so far? Again, no filter. I only got like four hours of sleep. This, this should just say the American dream got in the way. I might get a drink while you all process that one. <laughs> Did he just say he doesn't love America? I didn't say that. I said, to me, this is what this is describing. Like, and it's not just the American dream. It's the like, lie that exists in the world. Matthew kind of says it similarly. Matthew chapter 13 says, The seed sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and lure of riches choke the word, and it bears no fruit. So it's growing. It's got a root system. 
but something grew along with it. Luke chapter 8, 14 says, as for the seed that fell among the thorns, they're the ones who have heard, but as they go along, they are choked by the anxieties and riches and pleasures of life, and they fail to produce mature fruit. Remember the parable Jesus said in Luke, he says, the thorns grew along with it, right? They grew together. So here's the thing. We, I think in our day and age, and when it comes to like crossroads as a church, what we have to recognize is the thorns represent a type of personal spirituality, personal Christianity, my personal Lord and Savior. I'm not opposed to those types of things, but they, they grow up together with the gospel of peace, and it chokes and it, it's marked by distractions in our world. Like there is a spirituality within the Christian world, within, within Christianity, that is just marked by, oh, they, you look really good. Like you go to church all the time, you sing, you volunteer, you do all these different things. But what's grown up with that is a personal brand of spirituality that like I'm no longer going to hell. I get to go to heaven. I'm good. Meanwhile, like the world is still living in hell, <laughs> right? The, the five unacceptables persist and just move forward and move forward because we've been distracted by the world. And we just go, well, I made this much money. I have this much time. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to just enjoy life. God's going to clean it all up in the end. And there's all these distractions that, that get in the way of saying, no, I'm called to be a peacemaker, like Christ before me, Christ behind me, like Christ all around me, like I'm to see this world through this lens of peacemaking versus personal spirituality that says, well, I'm just trying to not go to hell, right? And, and in a post-enlightenment world, people that hear, they're like, what are you talking about? So there's these distractions. And it's a faith that really never gets to maturing faith. It's a faith that never really matures to see it like Jesus, a cruciform life, this life in Christ, where my life is hidden in the gospel of peace, my life is hidden in my actions and my attitude that is marked by this radical love, radical love. But instead, I'm focused on personal morality, moral theism, keep the gods happy. It's basically what it is. Zeus is upstairs. I got to be careful. I don't want one of those lightning bolts coming for me now or later. And it just kind of gets stuck there. And, and, and let me tell you what, this spirituality works because it feels really good. It, 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 it raises money, right? Like when I can attach your eternal security to how much money you put in that offering basket when it goes by, like we could build another building. But it just, it doesn't produce the peace in the world. It doesn't rewrite the, the unacceptables. It doesn't really bring hope to the world. Like I'm, I'm just trying to remember that really famous thing that's said at Christmas time. Oh yeah, peace on earth. <laughs> peace on earth. It's not like peace in Ryan's heart. No, no, no. This is like about peace on earth. Okay, so let's get to the rich soil. Somebody say amen. Wrap it up, right? <laughs> Nobody said wrap it up. I appreciate that. I thought it was coming, but okay, here we go. Mark chapter 4 describes the rich soil this way. But those sown on rich soil are the ones who hear the word, they accept it, and they bear it, and they bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, right? That's how Mark describes it. Listen to Matthew. Very similar. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word. See, Matthew says, and understands it. Because Matthew says back when he's talking about the path, there are those that receive it, but they don't understand it. Too much trauma, too much pain. That's the work of the devil, right? That language that steals, right? But now they understand it. They experience it. It comes into their innermost being, right? And they indeed bear fruit, and they yield 100 or 60 or 30 fold. Just switches the language there a little bit. Luke describes it like this. I kind of, I like the way Luke finishes out. Luke says this, as for the seed that fell on the rich soil, they are the ones who, when they have heard the word, they embrace it. They embrace it with a generous and good heart. Isn't that good? Luke wins. Luke wins, the, Luke wins for this one, right? They embrace it with a generous and a good heart and bear fruit, oh, this is good, through perseverance. They bear fruit through perseverance. So, so what about us? Like, as we think about it, like if we were writing our own gospel for Northern Colorado, right? The gospel according to Crossroads. It's not sacrilegious, right? We would say this, that the rich soil, right? The rich soil is the place where peacemakers generously love people. They generously love people in the complexity of their trauma, their doubt, their opposition, and their distraction. 
Like the rich soil is just a persevering in the other fields. It's just it's a love that doesn't give up. It's a love that doesn't give up. So don't miss this. This is what I think, like for us, the, like what this parable can speak to us is the hope. To keep hope alive, it demands that we persevere in our commitment to love, regardless of the field we find ourselves standing in. And it's not so easy to just say, oh, a person is either, you're either a path or you're a thorn or you're a rocky soil or you're a rich soil. I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. Your life is complex and my life is complex. You've got all four of these fields in your life and I have all four of these. There's parts of my life that are the path. I'm like, get God out of there. I got too much pain, too much hurt. I don't want to bring faith into that one. Nope, I don't have God. I have any part of that. There's parts of mine that are still thorny, like where that personal spirituality raised up and I still fall into trap and I get afraid of God sometimes and I get afraid I'm doing it wrong and what's going to happen. We all have those spaces in our lives. And, and here's the thing, like what this story, what this parable I think is teaching us is you, you persevere in love regardless of, of where your feet stand, regardless of the soil, the, so, the seed is sown over and over and over and over again. Work that soil, right? Shoe off <laughs> the birds, tend to it, like go to work. I mean, this story isn't about, well, just this is the way it is, leave it there. Don't worry about the rocky soil, don't worry about the thorns, no. We just recognize, oh, this is what's going on here. There's trauma. This is a person who took hold of it, but then they had an experience that, man, it just it didn't support them in their questions, didn't support them in their pain. Here's the thing about faith. Like faith, hope, and love, right? These three things last forever, uh, Paul teaches. I think that's really beautiful. But I also think there's a connective tissue between them. I think that faith drives us to love. And I think that love produces hope. And I think when you're now experiencing hope, you say, where does this hope come from? And it drives a person to faith. You see how that works? It's a cycle. Now I find this faith that's founded not in moral theism, but in love, in grace, in, a God, in one God, overall, in all, through all. And that drives me to do what? To love, which produces hope, which produces faith. Which, that's the cycle here, right? They work together in tandem. Galatians chapter 6 uh, Paul writes to a church that's confused, and he says, let's not grow tired of doing good, for in due time we shall reap our harvest if we don't give up. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to, what's the word? All. Oh. Well, but then he says, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. There's something powerful about caring for one another in a unique way within a community of faith, but never to the neglect of caring for everyone and loving everyone. So we love all, we persevere in this. So how do you do this in your everyday normal life? How do we do this as a church in our everyday like operationalizing of this principle? A couple things really quickly. Number one, as a church, we have to commit to creating hope-filled spaces that honor the power of trauma. We cannot produce, we cannot create spaces that simply say, oh, you're trauma, you just need more of Jesus. Let's pray for you. That's, I think that's toxic. We can't downplay it and say, oh, that was just life before Jesus. Now Jesus has set you free. I think we have to honor the power of trauma. And we can do trauma-informed ministry. And we can recognize that here's the truth of it. This is, this, this is the reality. Like, volunteering is powerful and important, but volunteering can be a traumatic experience for a person who's been used at a church that just used them over and over and over and over again and, and made you to feel guilty because you didn't volunteer enough, right? So, so their call comes to volunteer. It's a trigger for people with significant trauma and they'll, they'll walk out the door and I can't blame them. And it's not that, not that our church maybe did anything wrong, but we're just living in a path. <laughs> so we have to honor the path. This is what the path is. So how do I make sure that the seed can fall on a path and, and trauma doesn't choke it out. The devil, the enemy, the lies, the pain, whatever words you want to use, doesn't choke out and make it so they can't understand it. And I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot out there that's helping churches do this, like think about trauma-informed ways of doing church, especially when the church has been the source of trauma. So we need to create spaces, right? Whether it's small groups, time in our services, in our worship services, that we just like honor that this is... This can be a trigger. This can be 
a hard thing to understand because of the pain. Second thing is this. I think we ought to create spaces that are filled, that, that, that encourage questions, right? We need to create an atmosphere that says, when you come into your doubt, you come into your opposition, like this is the place to run to. And we aren't going to answer all the questions. We're not going to have all the answers, but we're going we're gonna to just really relish in the questioning of it and the joy that comes in the wrestling. And we're not afraid of God. We're not afraid of the universe. We're not afraid of those things, right? We say, this is where, this is where it should happen. Churches tend to fear questions, right? We get afraid of them, but we want to be a space that welcomes them. And then finally, we ought to create hope-filled spaces that expose the dangerous distractions of our world. I think we do have to talk about those things that choke the life out of faith, the distractions, the lures, that, that stuff that can, can get us. And we have to talk about it in church world. It can be buildings. It can be, you know, fancy things. It can be moving lights. It can be in our individual lives, spending every penny we have on ourselves, spending every time we have on ourselves, ignoring our neighbors, ignoring the needs of us. We should talk about these things, not in a condemning way, but in a wise way. So we ought to expose the lies that are out there that distract us from that cruciform life that we talked about, the peacemaking path of Jesus. Things like greed, avarice, pride, lust, like these inherently produce bad fruit, right? So how do we expose that in a loving, caring way? And I want to encourage you, those of you who've been listening and you're taking this to heart, maybe two or three of you, uh, <laughs> and you're thinking, how do I do this in my own life? I just want to say this, like, when you, when you commit to living this radical love, you do have to create boundaries. And, and if you don't create boundaries, you'll get to the point where you just are going to give up because that boundary has it's become unhealthy for you. There's someone in your life, an individual that you have loved and loved and loved and loved and given and given and given and given. And you're the point of like throwing your hands up in the air and giving up. Rather than giving up, I would say giving in to a boundary, right? Set a boundary that says, here's how I can love in a way that doesn't harm me because I have to love myself, right? So that I can love my neighbor well. And so you, you set a boundary and we as a church have to do that too, can I, can I be honest with you? You saw like we got rid of a lot of books. That was creating a boundary. Because if we're going to be a safe space for people, we have to be careful about the, the type of things that we have in this space. And so we might say this author doesn't fully ascribe to our values of inclusion. And while this author might write wonderful things in certain areas, I would never want a transgender person to walk in and see a book in our building by a person who's been pretty outspoken, let's say, against the transgender community, even though they might write wonderful things about finances or they might write wonderful things about loving the poor. Like we have to put a boundary there in the way in which we love everyone. And so it just says, well, that's not going to be a resource we, we, we espouse or that we put out there. It's not to say that person's evil or bad or that author is all the terrible. It's just to say there's boundaries and it's healthy and it's okay to do that in our lives. It's kind of a silly little little boundary, but in your life, you might have to do that. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's healthy. Jesus had boundaries, right? Uh, there were just times you just have to set those in place. Here's the thing. When we live into this, when we persevere in love, we set boundaries, we create hope-filled spaces where you can ask questions. We create hope-filled spaces to honor trauma, right? When we support one another, those types of things, something really powerful happens. When love perseveres, right? People find hope to overcome the greatest evils in this world. That, that spirit of overcoming. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Now let's talk about this word overcome because this can be a trauma word, right? Like you just got to overcome. You just got to overcome. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Overcome. And then when you find yourself still in the midst of grief after five years, 10 years, 15 years, you're made to feel like there's something wrong with you and you haven't overcome. That's not true. That's not accurate. That's not what it means to overcome. Can I give you my definition of overcome? I think to overcome is to live beautifully despite, despite the uncertainty, the pain, and the disappointments in life. It's to live beautifully with those, right in the center of it, right in the center of the pain, right in the center of the loss, 
Because here's the thing, to overcome is not to remove the evil in our world. It's not going to happen. It's not to remove the pain. It's not to pretend that the loss didn't take place. It's not to pretend that the hurt isn't real. It's to honor it, acknowledge it, and then still be able to live beautifully in the midst of it, which means one day you may feel like you're a hot mess. That's okay. We live beautifully in the middle of it. That's, that's, that's what hope is. Hope is this strength to live in the middle of the pain, of the disappointment, of the problem that's never going to go away. It's the ability to live in the middle of the diagnosis that's not going to change, in the middle of the financial reality that's not going to change. It's, you can live right in the middle of it, and you can live beautifully, and that's what hope is. And so it's loving others, it's caring for others in the midst of our tears, in the midst of our broken hearts, in the midst of our fears, in the midst of our doubts, it's still sowing the seed as beautifully as we can. So as we wrap up, we're going to sing a song together. And, uh, or you might want to listen to it, whatever it might be. But it, the, the key lyric in this song for us as we finish says, I want to build my life on this powerful love. That's what I want to do. Maybe God's inviting you this morning to not give up. There's some space that you were just going to give up on love. And God's saying, don't give up. Set a boundary. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Maybe God's inviting you this morning to kind of look at the different fields of your life. You know, your relationships, your finances, your spirituality, your emotional health, your mental health. And just say, like, how, how receptive am I to God's presence in these fields? Like, do I have some, do I have some paths that I need to honor? Like, do I have some thorny ground in my life that I just need to hold and say, it's okay, I just got some things growing up <laughs> together there, and I just need some love and support and encouragement. So would you do me a favor? Would you stand up? As soon as we're done with this song, we're going to give our blessing and dismissal. But just if you want to sing along, sing out, if you just want to let the words kind of wash over you, do that, and then we'll get out of here.